On the next Empire Report, augmented limbs. More and more popular, but where is the source genetic material coming from? The answer may shock you, and... Stranded for days. A harrowing tale of survival as one hauler's emergency beacon went unanswered. Learn what you can do to protect yourself. Plus... It's been rumored to be in the works for years, but is the Black Jacket reunion tour finally going to happen? We got the dirt, baby. All that and more on the latest Empire Report at 2200 SET. Welcome to episode 36 of Around the Verse. I'm Sandy Gardner. And I'm Ben Lesnick. South by Southwest was a success. Chris presented up on the Geek stage on Friday night. Yep, right. hopefully we've introduced a lot of new uh, backers to Star Citizen. Um, we also won an award. Yes, yeah. the most anticipated crowdfunded game award. I hear it lights up as well. It does light up. It's uh, on display in the Austin office presently. Um, thank you for anticipating us. And Sunday night we had the closing party. Check it out. have a lot of new backers so that's very exciting for us. I saw the numbers are way up. Um, hopefully people are discovering Star Citizen and it's just going to get better with the uh, FPS and social stuff coming uh, in the near future. And in case you missed it, Chris uh, also managed to post a new letter from the chairman on Friday. Uh, so if you're interested in kind of our release strategy for the next few months of Star Citizen, check that out. US UK Racing have added Star Citizen decals to their rally car. This is pretty cool. It's one of our backers who has added uh, some of our logos, the RSI, Anvil, and so forth, to their uh, rally car. Um, check out some pictures. And happy birthday to the Wing Commander movie, one of Ben's but, favorites, which turned 16. Yes, in fact, I. I I uh, put that in the script because it was the first time I ever met Chris Roberts in person was at the premiere of the Wing Commander movie 16 years ago. So. There you go. <laughs> and now it's time for news from around the verse. Let's uh, go to the spectrum. Hi, I'm Darren Borlick, Production Coordinator at the Star Citizen Cloud Imperium Game Santa Monica office. And with me, I also have Ellen Bachelor, our uh, senior modeler, yep. or senior 3D artist and right. ship modeler. Exactly. Yep. Uh, so Travis is out in uh, Colorado over visiting the Ilphonic guys. So we've got Ellen kind of fit, uh, sitting in with us today. So we're going to be talking about uh, what we've got work going on within the LA office. So we've got three ships in the pipeline, and the ones that we've discussed before. We've got the the Merlin, the Freelancer, and the Herald. Uh, but we're also working on, as a couple times we mentioned in the past, that we're working on weapon and mount standardization. And uh, we've given some very light information on it in the past. So now that we have our, our actual artist with us today, we can kind of go over a little more details about as far as what exactly that entails. Uh, what's going on with those and where we're at with a lot of them. So uh, Elwin himself is actually working on the Merlin. So what, what can yep. you tell us, what kind of ship is the Merlin? Uh, well, for starters, the ship uh, is basically supposed to be a very light, lightweight interceptor, which is, I mean, it's technically considered a snub fighter mm -hmm. and it is part of the constellation. So when the constellation gets into a fight, you can have somebody run to the back of the ship, hop into the Merlin, detach from the back of the constellation and then help out in the fight. So it's a really fast, 
an agile ship, which packs quite a bit of a punch for its size, but it can't really take too much of a hit. So it's, it's a glass cannon, basically. Basically, yeah. And it's not the same manufacturer as the Constellation either, right? No, it's not. It's actually Kruger Intergalactic. Okay. And uh, the Constellation is made by uh, Robert Space Industries. So that means that the Mustang, oh, I'm sorry, not the Mustang, the, uh, the Merlin has uh, a different style. It doesn't look like a Aurora or a Constellation. Right. And this is their first ship that we're manufacturing, right? I think so, yeah. It's the first one that we're manufacturing. It may be the first ship in the lore that the company has actually put out. Right. So there will be more in the future. And as far as, like, you, your job with it is doing the 3D modeling for it. So we've got right. several stages. One is the white boxing, which is, why don't you explain what white boxing is? Well, so basically, um, well, the white boxing stage is where we sit down and we grab all of the components that the ship requires, such as a power plant, a radar, a cooling unit, um, things engine. like that. Yeah, so the engines, like the size of the thrusters, it's maneuvering thrusters, whether it can hold one or two people and things like that. So the white boxing stage, we grab all of those components and we just we make sure that they all fit within the actual shape of the ship, right? So what ends up happening inevitably is that from concept to 3D modeling, the shapes end up having to change mm -hmm. in order to accommodate the actual mechanics, right? right? So uh, previously, uh, the Merlin as it existed wasn't able to accommodate all of those components. So the shapes of it had to change just slightly in order to make sure everything fit properly within the ship. And so right now we're at the stage that we call kind of unofficially gray boxing where we've got those components that are fit and now you're actually going about the modeling. Uh, right. So at this point, what, what's the part that you're working on right now? Right now I am, I am doing like the straight up modeling. So I'm working on the geometry as it's going to be in the final product. And as far as where on the ship, like the hull or the cockpit? Oh, or... I see, I see. Well, it's, it's a pretty small ship, so I find myself bouncing around back and forth, sometimes just trying to get a good balance. Because mm -hmm. part of what I'm doing is because the shape's changed, I, it also means that I have to worry about the overall design and how it affects the, the lines on the ship. Um, so currently I'm actually working on where the ring connects to the, to the nose. Okay. And what are some of the inspirations that you've used? Uh, well, for Kruger Intergalactic, because they hadn't had a very uh, defined style yet, I was I was able to take a lot of freedom to like choose the direction. Um, so I ended up using a lot of uh, automotive design, like sports cars. Yeah, sports cars. Specifically, I used the Mustang, the Ford Mustang, for not yeah, not the Ford the, Mustang, yeah, <laughs> not, not the, not the um, consolidated uh, right, Mustang. Right. <laughs> very different Mustangs. Um, I also used uh, inspiration from Lamborghinis, just small details. But really the character was, like the character of the ship for me was supposed to be this sort of angry ship because usually you use it when you're about to get into a fight, right? right? Just or you're trying to defend yourself, sleep. yeah. Um, I think people are really going to dig it. It nice. looks pretty cool. And another thing that Elwin's also working on is um, we call our standardization of weapons and weapon mounts. In the past, we've talked about how we're trying to make sure that each different size conforms to a very particular standard, such as the, the weapon box for when ships are being created. So can you explain a little bit in a way that um, why is this going to benefit us and how is this going to help out? Okay, so the goal for me was to come up with a system that was understandable by all of the artists without them having to worry about the actual mechanics of what a specific weapon would have to do. Because at the end of the day, we, you know, we need to get the artwork out. And mm -hmm. sometimes those mechanics change, but we have to make sure that whatever we make still works. So the goal for me was basically to determine a maximum bounding box. So what that means is the largest possible area that any given weapon size would have to be able to fit. Even if it's a size one railgun versus a size one Gatling cannon or something like that. They have different shapes but I had to determine what the maximum possible size for a size was. And then we would use that box in order to place it onto a ship during the white box phase to make sure that we could accommodate for any given weapon of that size. Okay. So that would mean is if, for example, I have a size two uh, neutron cannon, for example, or, or whatever, um, I would know that it would fit in that slot, period, right. no matter what. Now, what about the weapon mounts? Uh, so you're, the weapon you're standing mounts, out, standardizing the mount size too, right? Right, exactly. For the same reason, mm -hmm. right? So the, the, the weapon mounts are sort of a step above the weapon. So we've got a basic bounding box for the weapon. Then on top of that, we would put a mount, which would increase the size that I have to allocate as a ship artist. Um, and this would be used to determine whether there's enough clearance on a gimbal. You know, if I put a weapon on a wing, I have to make sure that 
when I put a gimbaled weapon on it, there's enough clearance for the gun to actually articulate. Right. Otherwise, we run into problems. So that's what that system was basically built for, which is to facilitate us being able to make ships that would accommodate whatever weapon the... Ag agnostic of what the weapon actually looks exactly, like. Exactly, yeah. And, I mean, that, that also benefits us. That same system is basically what we're using for what I think we're going to end up using for all the components. Sweet. So basically that would mean that all of the interior locations on a ship that would hold components, they could hold It'll whatever fit. component. Yeah, a game designer comes up with. It'll fit. Nice. And that's all we've got from the Santa Monica office. So again, I'm Darian Borlick, uh, production coordinator, and this is Ellen Batchelor, our uh, senior art, uh, 3D artist. So thank you guys. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, David Langoliers. I'm senior producer at Elphonic. Chuck Ringard, president of Elphonic. And Travis Day, producer of Cloud Imperium Games. So this week, uh, we had a couple new things to talk to you guys about. Um, after PAX, we're frantically working to get everything in order for the actual FPS release, which should be coming down the pipes really, really soon. Uh, one of the things we've been working on is the recharge station. So, two types of weapons that we have in FPS. We have ballistic weapons that fire traditional projectile-based ammo. Um, then we have energy-based weapons, uh, much similar to ships. For those energy-based weapons, we need a way for you to refill your ammo. So we have a recharge station that we can place in the levels that lets you uh, wirelessly uh, recharge your weapon with energy ammo. And currently, we have it working with all of our energy weapons. Um, right now, we have one of the animators kind of uh, pre-visiting zero-g movement. Uh, one thing we uh, didn't really get around to before PAX was kind of making the, the zero-g movement the best it could be. So we kind of took a st step back and um, really are trying to get that previs so that um, Chris and the design team here and animators have something to go off of, even the coders, um, so we can work kind of towards the best vision. So, you know, what happens when you kind of approach a wall in zero-g? What happens when you turn around? Um, so yeah, we got a lot of the cool mechanics in, but we want to step up the animations um, on those. And uh, same with Ironside as well. We really want to make sure that's smooth and, and good as well. Um, so we're also pre-visiting that. And uh, yeah, we got Travis out here kind of uh, helping for a little while, kind of making sure everything's getting done on track and all that stuff. So yeah, it's a big fun. I actually, it's funny, before I came out here, I read some forum posts from people that were like, oh, he's going out there. He must be in trouble. Or, oh, he's going out there. He's like going <laughs> to... Cracked a whip. It's like, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. We're coming out here to like hang out and help, and we got a bunch of. I think one thing people don't realize is that, like, yes, you guys are doing the core of the FPS gameplay, but there's still a lot of stuff like lobbies and different UI interfaces and character work and all these different pipelines that are run out of the different studios. And if anybody's getting the whip cracked on them, it's like basically having me here to service you guys with all of our other studios. Can you say that again? Yeah, I mean, I'm here to service you guys. <laughs> um, no, and it's awesome having Travis here and, and you know, kind of your main point of contact and producer for CIG out here because um, there's a lot we can get done, a lot of decisions that could be made very quick and on the fly and, and stuff like that. So it's kind of it's kind of cool. We don't have to like email and, and wait for that. It's like kind of instant on demand. So it's cool. Yeah, and then my topic I was going to talk about because uh, I did the interview with Calix and the rec system is we'll be bringing rec to FPS. So you'll be able to get rec in FPS, earn it. A rec you earn in Arena Commander will be a transferable and purchasable for items in the electronic access store for the FPS and vice versa. And so this week we're kind of finalizing the design on that, how much will be earned, what items are available for purchase, how much they cost, and all that good stuff. So something to look forward to, something new to purchase with your rec and new ways to earn it. Yeah, we're excited. Yeah. Yeah, about wraps it up for this week. I don't think we have anything else. Hey guys, I'm Jake Ross, associate producer of the PU here in Austin, and here with me this week I have Rob Reiniger, a senior technical designer, and I'm Jason Hutchins, I'm a senior game producer. Yeah, and this week I got an update for you on some of the stuff we got going on in the PU. Um, so we have a, um, a character artist here, Billy Lord, working on uh, actual sculptures for the Terra planetside environment. Um, it's very organic, these sculptures, so it's really nice to have a character artist who knows how to, to sculpt and model and, and, uh, and things like ZBrush to help uh, bring those things to life. 
Uh, we also have Ted Berjan working on a solar panel prop for the space stations. Uh, he finished up with a radar prop a couple weeks ago, and this is another one of those huge hulking kind of uh, giant props you'll see uh, you know, latched onto the side of the space stations that you fly by on the PU. Uh, and then we also have the initial kind of um, program programmer work being done on the uh, on the mining gameplay. Um, Andrew Wynn's working on the on some of that. And so um, here, hopefully, pretty soon, you'll be we'll be able to have a, a prototype of, of some of the um, initial um, kind of jobs and in, 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 um, positions within the, the mining ship um, uh, working. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, I'm going to pass it off to these guys. They're going to talk a little bit about the demo that you guys saw, um, or the video you guys saw at South by Southwest this past uh, weekend. So, okay. Yeah, we worked uh, really hard in the last uh, couple weeks to put that uh, video together. Um, that video was going to be a kind of an introduction to people who uh, were not Star Citizen fans, uh, but were uh, gamers at South by Southwest. And so we wound up doing a lot of footage that was uh, both uh, reuse of old footage uh, from other commercials in the past, and also we created a lot of new shots where we added a lot of new characters, uh, character art, uh, a lot of new environments that we haven't really shown off before around uh, Art Corp. And uh, Rob here, did a, a, we did a lot of late nights uh, crunching to get some uh, good footage, right, of getting the new characters in, and, and uh, that was fun. So I don't know if you want to talk about it. Yeah, no, it, it was a blast. I mean, we... Um Working late is always a, an interesting time because you're, you're sitting there cracking jokes and you get to be a little more free with uh, <laughs> how you behave, let's say, uh, around the <laughs> office. But uh, no, it's fun. Uh, we working really hard just trying to get the Area 18, which is the first landing zone that we're going to be releasing ready for you guys. Um, had a little shift in direction uh, just because of the, we decided to go from uh, playable demo to, to video to kind of you know cater to a little bit different audience, but. Um, a lot of the work that you saw or, or the stuff that's in that landing zone is actually going to be stuff that we're using in-game. So um, it's really cool that we're finally on a track to, to be, you know, keeping the stuff that we're doing uh, in the game and preserving, you know, the work that we're doing and not just in demo mode so much. Yeah. You know, I, th I think we're all pretty excited about that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's really starting to come together. And, uh, you know, uh, Nate Blaisdell, uh, you know, Sean Tracy, uh, Billy Lord, Vanessa, David Jennison, Brian Brewer, you know, Daniel Craig, a lot of people that were working on it. So thanks, guys. Lee, uh, Lee yeah, Lee, Lee a lot of last one effects uh, force for us, which was great. Yeah, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a few people, but uh, it came out really well, and then we're all really excited. So if you haven't checked it out, definitely go check out the South by Southwest video. Um, so a lot of positive feedback, I think. Yeah, so we just far, so. posted that uh, last night, Sunday. Yeah. So yeah, it's, been, it's a lot of fun. So it's uh, keeping the train going. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right, thanks guys, appreciate it. We'll see you around. Thanks, guys. Hi, I'm Mark Snowden. I'm the lead VFX artist at Foundry 42. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, thrusters. Um, last week I did a first pass on the Gladiator thruster. Um, so the first part of a gladiator thruster, uh, basically that just means um, when we get a thruster task initially, we um, we need to take the uh, the information that we're given in terms of the the fiction. So the the writers um, of Star Citizen have information for every minute detail, and that includes even just the thrusters. So that might seem like a small thing to some people, but um, we need that information so we can kind of drive the, what that thruster is going to look like. Um, so for the Gladiator thruster in particular, that is using, um, I think it's Hammer Propulsion is the manufacturer. Uh, that may change, I'm not sure, but um, that's that's the current plan for that. So Hammer Propulsion would be typically um, a low-tech um, a low tech category. We have categories when we're making the VFX um, with a style guide. We've got currently we're working on the assumption that we've got a low tech, which is more of a kind of an old school approach. So you, I, I think of proper like classic afterburner style effects for for, for low tech, um, which for me are the most fun ones to do. I love that kind of you get that kind of shock diamond uh, look to the thruster, so I particularly enjoy doing those kind of effects. We've also got high tech, uh, which will be a much purer kind of visual style, uh, much more, I guess, your more kind of typical sci-fi, um, I think kind of Star Trek uh, thruster effects for that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so um, 
I kind of digressed a little bit, but yeah, the first pass on the gladiator uh, thruster really is just kind of taking taking that that fiction, taking the law, taking the design elements, uh, making sure that we're on the right track with that, and then just yeah, fleshing out the effect. Now let's go to Ryan Archer, who is interviewing senior producer Jason Hutchins. Hi guys, I'm Ryan Archer and I'm here at Cloud Imperium Games Austin and I'm with Jason Hutchins, one of our producers. And Jason, what's your job here in Austin? Ryan, I'm a uh, senior game producer for the Persistent Universe. Okay, so you work mostly with the artists and the programmers who are working on the Persistent Universe. And the, and the game designers as well. Oh, that's right, yeah, yes. Part of what I do is personal assistant to Tony Zurbeck, the game director, right. <laughs> as well as oversee the other producers that are working with the artists and the designers of them and the engineers and programmers. Okay, cool. So since you've been with Cloud Imperium, what's the thing you think you've enjoyed most working on? Oh, the thing I've enjoyed the most would be really kind of the cross-studio coordination with uh, our other partners um, and increasing the communication and effectiveness of that relationship. Okay. So you um, which sounds really boring. <laughs> Uh, to fans, I'm sure, but um, we've been able to, to do some really interesting things and kind of pick up the pace a little bit. Okay. So you enjoy the infrastructure a little more and the, the, the organization side of things? I do. I also enjoy doing more of uh, game design, uh, which is a departure from where I was at my last studio, where I was primarily working with uh, the engineers, Okay. Uh, which was super fun. But the uh, opportunity to work on uh, design and more game design and uh, interacting more with the artists is also a, it's a nice change of pace for me, and I, I really enjoy that. Oh, good. So how do you like the Austin studio compared to where you worked before? Well, yeah, you know, the pace is a lot different here uh, at Cloud Imperium um, at, the, at the dev studio. Um, that took some actually some getting used to, to be honest with you, but I, I'm still enjoying it quite a bit. Is the pace faster or slower? Oh, sorry, much faster pace. Much faster pace, yeah. Yeah. And you worked at Blizzard before, correct? I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was at Blizzard for 16 years. Uh, the vast majority of that was on a game called World of Warcraft. Okay. I think maybe some of us have heard of that game, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> probably. I don't like to make assumptions. but Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So what's the thing you're looking forward to the most as you work on this game? Well, so this game is kind of the game that I've always wanted to play. And the thing that intrigues me the most and the thing that I've always wanted to do is that um, vehicle to first-person shooter transition, right? So the idea of doing a boarding party or uh, fending off pirates that are trying to board your ship uh, and transitioning from space combat to first-person combat is the thing that really really interests me and um, presents some hard technical challenges to solve and also some hard design challenges to solve to make good and fun, and yeah. that's that's what I'm really interested in. Oh yeah, um, I think a lot of our fans are very interested in that as well. Uh, yeah, ever since I played first Battlefield, I mean 1942, and then a mod for it called Desert Combat that had such great like modern vehicles, and that transition between vehicle and, and infantry was just awesome. And I was like, man, we need to make a space version of this in <laughs> some way. So I figured the best way to get that to happen was come make the game. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So I take it you're a sci-fi fan then, right? Oh yeah, I am. Uh, besides the change of pace from you know fantasy swords and dragons, and uh, I am a I am a, a, a modern and sci-fi fan. So yeah. Oh, so this, this is the place for you then. <laughs> yeah. If you know, you always get the classic questions like you know Star Wars or Star Trek, and I'm like, can it be both? Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of us agree. <laughs> yeah. We're all we're all very strong fans of the genre of uh, sci-fi, and you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how do you like working? I know you get to work more with designers now. Mm -hmm. So, what is it about working with designers that you like the most? Actually, uh, I worked with designers quite a bit before. Uh, it's, it's not just the working with them. Here, I get to do a little bit more actual design input. Um, and so that's what I'm enjoying, is actually coming up with a design idea. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't, by any stretch of the imagination, say that I'm designing the game, but I'm, I'm doing more of that than I used to. Mm -hmm. Previously, I would take a design from somebody else, and this is what producers do, right? They'll chop it up into its component parts, get estimates on that work, put that together, uh, and you know, kind of make a plan on how to actually implement that to make right. sure that you're doing the right thing at the right time. You know, to right. use the house building analogy, you know, you, you build the foundation before you put the walls up, right? Uh -huh. So it's taking those kind of design uh, concepts and turning it into a plan, yeah. right? Okay. So here I'm both working with the other producers to, to do plans, but also actually putting some design 
thought into it from a design perspective. It's a big, big game. And uh, Tony Zervik, who's the game director on the Persisting Universe, uh, has big, big designs as well. And um, there's stuff that we need to do uh, that he's not always laser focused on. So I get to kind of put input on that. Right. When that's, that's super fun. It's, it's more fun than I was expecting. Yeah. 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 I've, I've had the privilege of eating lunch with Dirk Tony a few times, and we're, and he just he gets so into it, and he's explaining different elements. That he's oh yeah, on and it's so much fun because he he goes in so much detail. Um, is that something you really like about working with Tony? Is the detail that he likes to really delve into? Yeah, no, uh, it, it's very detailed, um, and it's it is both uh, easier and harder. It's it's easier because with that level of detail, people know what they need to do to to iterate that. Uh, not just iterate, but also just to implement so that we can begin the iteration process. Um, it's harder because that level of detail takes extra time, mm -hmm. right? So there are some times where probably we should be working on this thing and this other thing, but we're really only focused on the one that has all the detail. You know? Right. So I know Chris uh, is pretty proud of how um, we're able to work across the globe mm -hmm. with multiple studios. Yeah. Um, how do you find that work pro uh, of working with you know people in LA, people here, people in Canada, people in uh, the UK? Yep, and now in Frankfurt as yeah. well. Um, uh, it is it got its challenges, right? I think in a perfect world, in a perfect world, you would probably have a studio put together so you can work all in the same place. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's a lot of good reasons to do distributed development. One of the best things about it is that you get to have kind of a handoff every day where people spend their work day, say, this is what we got accomplished. We can now hand this off to another studio mm -hmm. and we kind of go all the way around the world, which is cool. It's like the sun never really sets on the Roberts empire at this point, right? <laughs> which, is, which is cool. Uh, the bad part about it, of course, is that uh, sometimes there's lag time, you know, like uh, the UK will be up and working and hit a problem that maybe somebody in, in Austin or LA has to fix, and of course they're sleeping, so they have to, to wait. Uh, and, you know, the other bad parts are all just logistic, you know, like you wind up having meetings through lunch or meetings through dinner, or the guys in the UK often have to watch us eat lunch when they're not eating dinner yet, but they're hungry, right? And that's mm -hmm. kind of a bummer. But I really should focus more on the positives, right? Which <laughs> the positives are we've got talent from all over the world, um, and you know you don't have to make them come to a place that maybe they don't want to to move to, right? right. Like maybe they don't want to live in Santa Monica, or maybe they don't want to live in Austin, so they can stay in Frankfurt or stay outside of Manchester, which is a super nice place, right? right. So um, those have got all those benefits. So the ability to have talent, you know, live places that they like to live and um, work on stuff that they like to work on is, is you know, that's immeasurable. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I know we have a lot of talented people that we've just recently got into Frankfurt. And so, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm very excited about those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I okay. mean, it's CryEngine is a, you know, a first person shooter engine mm -hmm. uh, and we want to make a mass we multiplayer game out of it. There are changes that have to be made to the engine and those guys are, you know, just the guys to do it. So right. excited to have those guys on board. Yeah. Is this the biggest game you think you've ever worked on? Well, one could argue that World of Warcraft is not a small game. <laughs> Uh, and for me, like, what do you do after that? Mm -hmm. I wanted to do something ambitious, and I, I couldn't think of anything more ambitious than this particular game. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be able to actually sit down with you. I know we worked together a little bit, and yeah. so to actually <laughs> delve into your background. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know that the fans would want me to say uh, thank you for all your hard work. Um, I, they're always super supportive of us, and I know that uh, they'd want you to know that they really appreciate all that you guys do. Awesome, I do appreciate it, and I, I don't, you know, we wouldn't be here without the fans, so thank you guys very much, and uh, keep the support coming, we need it, we've got a long way to go, I'm uh, very much looking forward to making the best game that I possibly can, because I want to play this game. Anyway, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks guys. <laughs> Hutchins, I just met. <laughs> <laughs> Worked so well last time. Uh, now let's head over to Will for this week's MVP. Hey everybody, I'm Assistant Community Manager Will here to bring you this week's MVP. This week's MVP comes from a game ideas thread started by Borax. Similar to the Geneva Convention, the Hadrian Convention will grant special protection towards healers and people trying to help out on the battlefield. 
That way, hopefully they wouldn't get shot at, and should they be captured, they'd have a better chance of surviving. Also, this week's organization is Deep Space Disco. They don't care about pirates. They don't care about fighting. All they want to do is listen to music and dance. So when I think about disco and Star Citizen, I think of Deep Space Disco. So thank you very much, guys. You're this week's MVP. Zane. Yes? Ready for my lesson? Yes. Uh, you know, remember last time we went over uh, the HUD and generally what each item in it represents? Is everything all right? But what about my skit? What? You know, the bit that we do before we fly? I can't do it without the skit. Last week we did the juicing. I always juice before I fly. There's nothing humorous about that. But the skit. I can't, I can't do it without the skit. Are you trying to beat Ben or are you trying to audition for Saturday Night Live? If you want to beat Ben, you have to learn to fly before you learn to fly. That doesn't make any sense. Neither does losing to Ben. He's horrible at dogfighting. <laughs>
So is are these keys Slide the same more. for everybody's keyboard? Yeah. Like yeah, using? unless you unless you want to configure it differently. To go into decoupled mode, it's caps lock. But if you want to change your other settings, uh, you you do control caps lock, and that kind of toggles. Uh, okay, the first mode is G safe off, but comms tab on. The second mode being G safe on, comms tab off. And then the third mode is both of them off. Yeah. And then yeah. but pressing I think, control I think caps lock. So control caps lock is just cycling different states of the IFCS. Right. But I think I want them all on, right? Yeah. yeah. So let's leave them off. Yeah. What about ESP? ESP stands for Enhanced Stick Precision, and we just introduced that. It lessens the sensitivity of uh, inputs, uh, like if you're using a joystick or a gamepad, mm -hmm. uh, once you get near a target. So if you're aiming at a target, inputs won't be as drastic, because it's, it's toning down the sensitivity, sensitivity of your input um, so, that, so that it helps you aim. But can you turn that off? You can. Uh, by going through the game menu. Oh, okay. You can go to options here and you can turn off ESP through the options menu. So G1, G2, G3, 33 apiece, what are they again? Those are your different power groups. So if we oh. switch over to our power screen, that's actually representing your power allocation. So it's split evenly. It's split evenly right now, but if we want to allocate more power to weapons, so say if we wanted to get more out of our energy weapons, oh. uh, we can uh, slide this pip over all the way to one. Oh, look how exciting that is. Yeah. But what, but what does that do? Does that mean that where do I lose power now? I can't fly as fast? Because, because you're allocating away from uh, G2 and G3, those will lose power. And G2 represents uh, your avionics and things like that. So that'll be, that I think that includes shields. Okay. And G3 and includes your thrusters. Okay. So there, it's split between weapons, um, systems, and thrusters. And is it so it's better just to split it evenly? Depends on the scenario. I just want to beat Ben. <laughs> okay, so if you're. I, I want to be if fast. I want to be you're, fast. If you're fighting someone, if you're fighting, if you're currently engaged in a yeah. dogfight with Ben and you want to you know, give him all you got, then. Uh, it's best to allocate all power to group one, allocate all power to weapons. But if you find that <clears throat> he is, you want to get away really fast and you want to maneuver quickly, and I you, can put it in three. you can allocate to three. You can allocate it to your thrusters. Okay, and there's actually a short key to do that. When you're not in interaction mode, yeah. you can press the one, two, or three keys, oh. and that'll correspond to which uh, power group. Uh, you're allocating to. All right, so it's, I feel like then I just go split it evenly, and then I can mm -hmm. use the one, two, three button if I want to quickly get away from Ben or shoot him down or right. pr protect from his weaponry. Right. All right. So the last one would be the shield management page, and this tells you um, where your you can allocate different segments of your shield to be um, prioritized over others. The so back. if we wanted to allocate on the back, yeah. then we just slide that pip all the way to the back. And this tells this segment status pane down here tells us uh, what our current allocation and shield health is for each face. Yeah, because Ben's always shooting me either from the back or yeah. from the right. And like the power screen, there is hotkeys for this. It's, uh, you can use the numpad for this. Okay. Um, so like I see. eight, four, six, two, kind of pretty much the arrow keys on the numpad. Okay. Um, sets this. Well, that's cool. I can like amp it up at the back. You can amp it up at the back, or if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're attacking head on, you can uh, allocate all the way to the front. So okay. full shields, uh, front, side, I uh, depending on where you're being attacked, it's better to have more um, allocation to um, a particular direction. I bet you Ben doesn't know that. <laughs> well, he does now. Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you. I'm going to go and practice. All right, I don't need to look at Ben when I say this because I am going to kick his butt. Well, I'm quaking in my space boots. Yeah, you should be. This Friday, Jump Point will be released. It's the long-awaited Retaliator issue. A lot of subscribers have been waiting for that one. 
More importantly, we are hoping to release 1.1 to the live servers later today. We shoot the show on Tuesdays, so um, there's always a possibility that on Wednesday or Thursday there would be some sort of disaster, but it's, it's looking good right now. Um, you know, we, we've spent a little bit of extra time on this one, and uh, I think it shows in the final project. And that 1.1 is going to be a very exciting release. We've got uh, manual and automatic landing. We've got the uh, long-awaited REC system. Uh, the Gladius is flyable, the retaliators in the hangar. We've made some uh, modifications to the flight model to improve the, uh, the old joystick versus mouse debate. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really big release. And more. And more. <laughs> There's more. So, <laughs> so uh, check that out uh, as soon as it's available. <laughs> All flyable ships in Arena Commander are available to test until tomorrow. And we will leave you with an art sneak peek. Thanks for watching and to all you subscribers for making this possible. We will see you next week on Around, Around the, the Verse. Verse. for anticipating us. Uh, the truth is, we anticipate us too. <laughs>